Welcome to Emotional Algebra with Dr. E. Emotional Algebra is a podcast that helps listeners to understand the subtle calculations people make every day in their relationships with others. We explore the unknown and known variables that affect interactions in everyday lives. Emotional Algebra is a podcast to help us all become better people. I'm Andrew Tavani, your co-host. And I'm Dr. E. Hi, Dr. E. Good to see you again. Before we get into it today, I got to tell you something. Uh, my wife and I have been binge watching a show on Netflix. And ever since we recorded that last episode, all the stuff we talked about was on full display so many times in this, in this show. So it's an interesting show. I'm actually, I'm not going to mention the name of it just yet. Cause I don't think you've seen it. Um, uh, but when you get a chance to see it, hopefully we could even talk about this in more depth, but so much of the, the, uh, roles that we explored in the last episode, uh, mm -hmm. I was seeing this in the characters. It was surfacing in the characters, their interactions, talking about the martyr, the the rescuer, the victim. This was all there, the learned helplessness. I, I just kept, I kept seeing it. And right. what I thought was interesting was, for one thing, I was like asking myself, am I seeing this? Because Dr. E and I just talked about this. Um, mm -hmm. But then I was convinced, no, uh, or maybe I was seeing it for that reason. But had, you know, this stuff is all underlying everything. And right. had we not talked about it, maybe I would have missed all that, you know? Right, right. And I think you're exactly right. All these rules are underlying everything. When we start yeah. to look at, at TV shows, we see, well, like I said, when we look, we've, we've made allusions to our political issues, to family issues, to all these areas, and it art imitates life. So in so many of these dramas and things that we see through our media, I do hope that people start to see these issues play out and then they start to turn the mirror maybe back on themselves and say, oh, I see. And that's where a lot of times, even when I do my work, I'm often giving examples to people of experiences before I'll tie it back to them because sometimes it's hard to look at ourselves. Like I said, that, that variation between our ideal self and our feel self. And then our real self, people often don't want to see those things because of the emotion, because of their, their own emotional algebra and, the, and the, the way that they've manipulated the variables within themselves. Yeah. And this show, uh, to, be, to be clear, it's a fictional show, a drama about a character. The main protagonist is going through many hardships in life. Uh, so I felt like it was just very rife with all of these dynamics that we're talking about. I mean, I would say it even adds, it enhances your viewing experience because you see these things. And perhaps with this show in particular, it might be uh, quite pronounced. So it was really interesting to see that stuff in a TV show, on a Netflix type of show. And I'm hoping, you know, it's easy to, easy to recognize that stuff on, on a drama that you're watching. I'm hoping to recognize that more in my life as I go through my daily interactions and so forth. A uh, little harder to objectively observe yourself um, but I know that's the homework, Dr. E, so we're going to do it. But let's get into today's, uh, well, let's talk about today's topic, which is going to be conflict escalation. Uh, you want to quickly touch on that before we review? Yeah, so, you know, we'll get into how we, how our emotions play into the escalation of conflict. And we're going to start to touch on the concept of what I call emotional specificity. A lot of times people talk about emotional intelligence and what's your awareness of emotions. But to me, there's a precise reason for every emotion as they exist. And that's so critical to this idea of emotional algebra because so many times people think we only experience one emotion when there are many emotions and they each have their own purpose. Either emotions are there to tell us things, teach us things, to show us things, help us do things for ourselves or do things for us, frankly. So in that and understanding conflict escalation is important, but also, you know, before we dive into that, I wanted to replay these roles because the emotions that we go through when we get into these different roles are so critical too. So what I have here on the screen is I just kind of have one of the slides that, that had all the roles played. So if we remember, we remember that we had that little circle here that uh, often plays that victim role. And if we look through the progression for the listeners, also, the victim can be anybody from the small circle all the way up to almost the biggest circle. Why can't it be the biggest circle? 
Well, because as we may remember, the victim has to surrender their power to get power uh, for, you know, to, to somebody else. So that's that's the irony. I think if you all may remember, and we'll get to this again, probably in scrolling through this, is that the victim really had the most power in what I call our victim culture. The persecutor, if there's a victim, there's always going to be at least a persecutor. So that person can be from the second smallest circle all the way to the biggest one. What we're often looking for, victims looking for, though, is the rescuer. And as we can see, that rescuer, and as you can hopefully visualize, that rescuer just has to have more power than the persecutor and the victim and can also go all the way up to the biggest circle. So in that and understanding these dynamics, the victim's always going to have less power than the persecutor and the persecutor is going to have less power than the rescuer because the rescuer has to have the power to crush the persecutor in order to rescue the victim. Remember that victims are often looking to be rescued. And if they aren't rescued or don't feel that anybody's there to rescue them, that's where then they play the two roles of either the justified persecutor or that learned helplessness role. And that's what we see a lot of going on in our cultures. There's so many situations and places where people want people to take that learned helplessness role. And that's what we want to recognize is how people who want to rescue us or even people who want to persecute us just sometimes want us to give up or give in so that we're surrendering our control and power. The justified persecutor, though, is often there to want to uh, have, have a reason for their anger, their rage, their hatred, their suppression of others based on their perceived victimization. Right. So looking at that, Dr. E, mm -hmm. a lot of roles here. Uh, as I was mentioning in the, in the TV show I was watching, seeing all examples of these, it was quite fascinating actually. And I guess that speaks to the good writing on the show too. Uh, but this is gonna figure heavily into what we're talking about today, which is conflict is. Escal escalation. So it is. let's uh, let's get into that then. All right, so let's, let's get through this. And just uh, as we get through this, just remember the roles that are chronically played, chronic victim and the games they play, the how much do you love me game, the persecutor plays the how much do you fear me game, the rescuer plays the how much do you worship me game. And as we're again, we're just finishing through who's got the most power, the victim. So remember all these pieces, especially as we go into the discussion of conflict escalation. That's why a lot of these, why it's taken a number of episodes to get to this point, and there's still more. The thing to look at and realize is that all these steps are necessary. So if you've kind of come in later in these episodes and now you're coming back and see these initial ones, which I really kind of hope people will do is go back through and remind themselves of all this, all the content that set up the, the discussions that we'll have later on. The thing to realize is, again, all these ways that power is played out in these models. And then uh, so now we're getting into conflict escalation. So I think if you might remember when we talked about the dichotomies, we talked about why we fight wars. So quick review, Andrew, do you remember any of the four dichotomies? Ooh, putting me on the spot, Dr. E. Uh, I think I remember, I think I can remember all of them, uh, win or lose, mm -hmm. um, good and bad. Mm -hmm. um, uh, help me out here, Dr. E. I got right two of them. Wrong and right strong. and wrong. Strong and weak, yes. Right, so, so the reason I review these is that it's important to understand which dichotomy becomes most important in a conflict. The most important dichotomy, uh, dichotomy in the conflict is to win or lose. Now we've tied our we've tied those those dichotomies to our political system. We've tied them to in, you know to relationships and to ourselves. And what's our dichotomy of choice versus our dichotomy of our of our um, our birth, you know, our temperament. Uh, so we've talked about those things. Now it's time to look at how this plays out in conflict. So I also asked people. What's the most dichotomy in terms of when we fight a war? So we know that the goal of the war is to win. So here's another pop quiz, Andrew. What's the most dichotomy, important dichotomy when we fight a war? Good, mm. strong, or right? I would say right would be my guess. A okay. Righteousness. Okay, so righteousness can be a combination of two different dichotomies. But think about it. When it comes down to it, which dichotomy do we often use at the point we get to that war and there's there's boots on the ground, there's missiles being fired? What are you trying? What is that culture trying to do or that country trying to do who's trying to conquer their opponent? I guess I guess that 
that country is trying to advance what they believe is a good. Uh, it's, it's all about strong. See, ah, strength. Okay. We, fight, we fight wars to win. To win, we have to look strongest. If we're strongest in that culture, or in that war, then we define the good and the right of the culture. We can't redefine a culture in its good or right until we win that war. So that's where, yes, we might have a war of words if you think about it, but often even those truths, those rights, those goods get lost in the escalation of emotions and the escalation of the rhetoric that's all about looking strong. It's about evoking intimidation, fear, doubt, helplessness, a lot of those emotions. So as we look at this and understand conflicts, well, then what do we want to do to understand them? So we have to look at strong and weak emotions. So as we look at them, what are emotions that look strong versus weak? And I'm usually when I do this in my office, I'm asking more questions. And here we're just going to kind of walk through them. So emotions in our culture that look strong, anger, pride, arrogance, happy, love. And love is a unique one. We'll get to more back more in a little bit. Respect, hate, joy, compassion, rage, humility, defiance. Flippancy, humor. Now, a lot of people have a question about what the heck is flippancy? I've never heard of it, you know? Flippancy is the I don't care emotion. And we'll we'll get more back to that in a little bit too and understanding that dynamic of flippancy. So we also can say humor. Well, we look at a lot of people who use humor to hide their weakness. Comedians, a lot of comedians, as we know, have their own issues that they're hiding behind their humor. Sarcasm is more of an aggressive humor. We have logic. Now, logic is devoid of emotion, but if I can use logic, then I'm not feeling. If, I, if I'm not feeling, then I don't hurt. If I don't hurt, then you can't hurt me. If you can't hurt me, I can't lose. If I can't lose, then I must win. So we look at these logical uses or applications of thought, logic, and even emotion we'll get to through this as we continue. So now we get to our emotions that look weak. Well, we have sadness, frustration. Well, a lot of people think frustration is a strong emotion. I say frustration precedes anger. Frustration precedes protective emotions. Frustration is banging your head against the wall again and again and again, rather than backing up and looking for the options that might be there. So that's why I clarify what frustration is about. And Dr. E, just let me stop you here for a second. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing love in both columns here. Mm -hmm. Exactly. What's going on? That's why I was going to get there because love can often be seen as the strongest and the weakest emotion in our cultural views and really to me in worldviews. Because if you love somebody who you feel has also betrayed you or violated you, using you, manipulating you, then love, it feels incredibly weak. So what we have to look at is how that shifts from when we're young and when we're first born, that we want to feel loved, then look at the culture around us and see that often we feel afraid to feel loved because we feel like it can be used as a weapon of control. I mean, just look at, you know, one 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 factor to look at is um, just today, what, what or this weekend, what's hit in the timeline of filming this was uh, P, uh, Sean Combs and his um, his abuse of his girlfriend at the time. And how that potentially in his mind was justified and how and why I'm not sure about the dynamics of how long she stayed through that, what the patterns of abuse were through that. But often our perceptions of abuse are even channeled through the concepts of love and the way we perceive love and really how unhealthy and dysfunctional it can become through the way we see ourselves in the world around us and in the context of our relationships. And that's really important for emotional algebra that we'll get to in the episode when we talk about relationships later. But yes, love is an extremely interesting emotion and how that can be used as a weapon and a tool. So as we continue, we have unsuccessful, compassion, unloved, abandoned, hopeless, helpless, apathy, humiliated, embarrassed, stupid, lazy, disrespect, doubt, threatened, confused, misunderstood, foolish, manipulated, fear, happy. Now we're in happy now. So happy was in both strong and weak, right, Andrew? 
It, yeah, it was it, another one. I'm, I'm curious as to why that can well, be seen as weak. Based, based on what I was talking about love, why do you think happy could be seen as strong and weak? I guess it could be manipulated is, 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 is sort of that way where you're going. I, I'm, I'm not totally sure. I mean, I, I feel like if you're like in the context that we're talking about in a war context, um, I feel like there's after winning a war, there's, you know, happiness because we've conquered. And like you said, we've defined the good and bad. We've defined the culture. Uh, and then there should be this period of happiness. I would think that's like you said, that should line up in the strong column, but there it is in the weak column. Well, think about people who look happy all the time. What do people often say about people who look happy all the time? And often, what do people feel happiness opens them up to? But vulnerability, potential betrayal, people I think who look happy all the time, people can sometimes refer to them as, as ignorant or they're, they're, they're not too, not that bright, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm that they're not seeing all the things around us that maybe we shouldn't feel happy about, you know? Sometimes even when a kid's getting in trouble and and they're smiling is sometimes somebody who's in power over them hierarchically will say, what are you smiling about? What do you have to be happy about? And that then is when we feel like happiness mm -hmm. becomes something that can be taken from us. So often people will hide their happiness or feel afraid to feel excited happy looking forward to situations because it's just something else that can be taken away. Yeah, that, that that's that's an interesting concept, Doctor. I mean, so many people spend their lives chasing happiness. They finally get it. And then you can't even have a healthy relationship with that happiness because you're so worried someone's going to take it or you're going right. to lose it somehow. Interesting. And that's where we have to look at it. in these hierarchical models. We view emotions as commodities. And that's why I separated them, the good, bad, the right, wrong, the strong, weak, the win, lose. And in this, you know, as we'll get into the discussion further and we talk about that idea of emotional specificity, we're going to see that each one of these emotions does have a purpose. But I'll, you know, I'll remind you, I think I talked about before when I went to Haiti and I was doing the community workshops in Haiti, one of the questions I was asked by one of the participants was, I heard sadness was a disease. Is that true? So we have to look at, again, even as we look at singular emotions and how they play out, we want to then look at how do we identify them and then what do we do with them based on our hierarchical views of these things and therefore how they'll play out in conflict as we'll see in a little bit. So we have happy, we have failure, guilt, shame, jealousy, envy. And then as we, so as we see, and this is a short list of emotions, really, I have a list of 260 emotions that I use in my office that obviously we're not going to go through here. This gives you plenty of information, data here for people to look at. But the issue with that list is if you took that list of emotions and I asked you to say, okay, put a check mark, uh, you know, let's say a blue check mark next to every emotion that you see is good and put a green check mark to every emotion that you think is strong and put a purple check mark to every emotion that you think is right. How many emotions out of 260 do you think people would see as good or strong or right? Good question. Out of 260, <clears throat> I would say maybe a third of that. Not so even. Not even, wow. Not even, close. not even close. When you look at it, it's really almost about an eight or nine or 10 to one um, emotions that look weak to emotions that look strong. Wow. And every emotion, like we said, if love can be turned to be seen as a weak emotion, happiness can be turned to be seen as a weak emotion. Almost every emotion we can identify as being bad and or strong and or weak. So that's why we have to think about why we do what we do with emotions. And then we get to that question below on that on uh, below the strong emotions is which emotions do we use in conflict okay so now what you want to remember is if the goal of the conflict is to win by looking strong then i'm not going to show love in a conflict right i'm not going to show happiness i'm not going to show compassion cuz that can be used to manipulate so i could even put and you can see compassion is on the other on the other column as well so most of these emotions can be shifted so what emotions am I, am I left with in a conflict? But anger, arrogance, which is a false protective pride, hate, rage, defiance, flippancy, sarcasm. And we'll try to use logic, you know, in this. 
But logic is often going to be channeled through other emotions. We just don't realize it. So I think I talked about kind of political, the political views where I thought that Democrats more likely use good to get to right. So they're going to use smugness and they're going to channel their logic through smugness or that type of that, that flavor of arrogance. It, whereas Republicans who are more likely to look, look strong to get to right to the win, they're going to look more brash and out there. And here it is, you know, and even that that's more of an aggressive to me type of arrogance. So we're even again, seeing more and more emotional specificity, the unique nature of each emotion and how they fit in. So, you know, when people get into conflicts, a lot of time I'll say, well, what did you feel when that happened? And they'll often go, well, I felt angry. And I say, let's look again. So as we see these emotions that we're talking about using here, you know, these protective emotions, and that's their purpose. We'll get to their more specific purpose in a little bit, but let's look and see what happens in a conflict and why. So in a conflict, we can look at the escalation of that conflict and how that happens. So we have power on, for you viewers or listeners, we have power that's on the vertical uh, this is a graph and it's on the vertical side of the graph and you have high power at the top to low power at the bottom. And then across the bottom, it's communication exchanges. So each exchange of communication that we have, we can look at what happens in that exchange in power. Okay. Any questions so far, Andrew? Uh, I'm wondering where, like what, what are the communication exchange types that we're going to talk about here, Dr. It, it can Dr. be. So that's a great question because what I'm often helping people to understand is often our first communication exchanges are body language, arms mm. crossing, legs crossing against somebody, a look in the face, a micro emotions. I think people might have heard that, con that, that discussion in the last decades about micro emotions, how they're just shown really quickly. We don't understand how much of our language is nonverbal. You know, I even just again an example, I realize people may might see that I'm standing when I do the podcast. Why am I standing? Because I do all my talks. If it's in my office, I'm at the whiteboard. If I'm doing presentations in front of groups of people, I'm standing. And I realize that I feel more comfortable standing. So from my point of expression and my hand usage and my eye, you know, my energy and even where I look when I'm talking. I have a lot better energy and engagement when I'm standing. When you look at a conflict, what often happens is there's even different roles in conflict if somebody's sitting behind a desk and the other person's standing, or if the person's standing over them and looking down on them. And there are a lot of times when I'm talking with people that I will purposely do things to trigger emotion, to help them to see how quickly these things happen. And now, like I said, often our conflicts are starting before the words are exchanged. Yeah, and when you do things, what types of things are you talking about? Are you talking about body language type stuff or, or something else? Body language, I'll point out their body language. If I'm standing, I'll walk up and get literally stand right over them and look down on them and I'll give a facial expression. And then other times I might, if I'm working with somebody to try to help to see how to defray a, a, a discussion or even really while I'm talking to people before we get into this, a lot of times I'll squat down and I squat down to get to their level. And we talk about that shift, how there are all these subconscious shifts. So what the most important thing to me to understand is even before we register that a conflict has begun, is to start to look at what's happening as the dynamics are changing behind me. As like I said, how many people are in that conflict? What's happening with their body language? What have they been doing before? How have they been primed in advance? And that's the thing we want to realize is our emotional algebra <laughs> is set up so far in advance of our conflicts that we don't even realize we're getting drawn into a conflict, sometimes just by walking to an event, sometimes by walking up to a person, or even thinking about meeting with that person or talking with that person. Our belief systems, our attitudes, our emotions are often pre-primed. Interesting, Dr. E. So let's take a look at the graph again then. Okay. Uh, where do we where do we go here? Well, so what you know what you can see is I have that point of resolution. That point of resolution yeah. to me is is a midpoint of finding some some equity so to, to see that there's balance. And even in this conflict, I start I start I start with saying that that person came here. Uh, you can see the little red line. So for viewers, the, the point of resolution is about just halfway up the graph. 
of the from low to high power. So it's not that we're looking for people to have high power versus the other person or that, you know, both people can feel like they both end with a great deal of power in that situation. But because we're getting into that discussion of power over versus power with, this is kind of that just the classical way that I look to explain this. Do Dr. E, looking at this, it almost looks like meeting in the middle. I mean, am I reading that right? Or Yeah, that, that's exactly why I did that. So people can find the ability to meet in the middle. But often, you know, with that, with that comment, with that red line, that's an exchange between two people. That what I'm saying is often conflicts start with just a neutral exchange. The example I often use with families is the parent gets home from school. They ask their child, hey, did you get your homework done yet? And immediately that's where the conflict might start verbally. But remember, if they don't have the child doesn't have their homework done, they're potentially already feeling guilt, shame embarrassment, failure, they're feeling threatened. So they're coming in with this pre-primed. So now they, but let's say that they're not pre-primed and they're just asked that question. So then what happens next? Well, that person perceives a loss of power. So for viewers or listeners, now what we're showing is the different colored arrow signifying the other person. So each color signifies a different person. That arrow, that, that line goes down. They're losing power because of the emotion that they're feeling and the way we perceive those emotions in our hierarchical cultures, guilt, shame, failure. In our culture, those emotions are seen as bad and wrong and weak, and you feel like you lose if you express that. So in this exchange now, if this ended right here, then the child might say, yep, I goofed up. I can, let me go get my homework done. I'm sorry. I take accountability. That would be a great way for that conflict to end, which even wouldn't have necessarily have been in a loss of power because there's an acceptance of responsibility. Okay. So now what happens here? Well, if but that, great. let me, let yep. me stop you right there for one second. Most kids don't, don't respond in such a good way to resolve that conflict right there. Most times, right. There's going to be an escalation there. The kid is going to have some excuse or some, uh, you know, some Check. reason why, or maybe even a, maybe even like some comeback that's disrespectful or something, you know. It, it, exactly. And that's the issue is they don't want to lose. Because again, what have our kids been socialized into? What yeah. have they seen, whether it's at home or in the media or with their peers or in school, all these different places we go, we see this issue where you're not supposed to lose. So then what do they respond with? Well, they respond with maybe a response. Well, I didn't have time to do it. I got home and the dog ran away and I was just wanted some time to relax. And don't you understand the pressure I'm under? So they start playing this game. And then what does the parent feel? The parent potentially then feels threatened. So now what you're seeing is the air, the line going up of, of, the, of the child in this example and the red line of the adult going down because now the adult feels mm. threatened frustrated, manipulated, confused. So then they respond with, how many times do I have to tell you? So they try to get their power back through their expression of emotions. Now note that here, we're not getting to the point of anger. We're getting to the point of often cognitive defenses, justification, rationalization, minimization, denial. And we're going to touch on those in the next episode and how we do that. But just to understand how this escalation happens is these are logical. This is These are cognitive, what we call cognitive defenses that are used as our first line of defense often. So then you have that with a parent then escalating and justifying. So is that, uh, how's, is that making sense to you, Andrew? Absolutely. And, and I was going to say too, this, this may not be resulting in anger yet, but I feel like we're on the road toward anger, right? Exactly. On the road again. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. So then what happens? So then the kid comes back. You don't understand. I've got all these responsibilities. You don't care about me, all the stress I'm under, you know, so then they, then people start feeling, and that words used often today, gaslit, that you're just, you know, the parents are like, you're just trying to put one over on me. Why? Because trust has been compromised. And I don't have trust on that list of strong emotions where that should it be. That's where it should be. And it should also be on the side of weak emotions because people often want to exploit trust to, in order to gain advantage in a conflict. Just look at what happened in, happens in political issues all the time. 
trust me, I'm not going to invade this company, this country, you know, and even our political roles, trust me, I'm going to take care of you once elected. So we have to realize where these conflicts are all being played out and why this all happens. So what you start to see, and I'm not at the, and not getting to micro level, but you start to see this exchange where if you're a listener, the, the, the lines of that are going from the lower levels of power then reacting or rebounding to the upper levels of power with each exchange are getting lower at the reception of what the person says. So with the explanation or the excuse or the how many times do I have to tell you to get your homework done? Well, then the child feels more guilt, more shame, more failure, embarrassed, maybe confused, misunderstood. Look at all these emotions mounting as well as the intensity of each emotion mounting. And then you have their re reaction. So to me, conflicts in our culture aren't about responding. They're about reacting. They're about retaliating. They're about getting my power back as soon as I feel it's been taken. So what we see is this zigzag almost around this line of, of this point of resolution where people could choose to resolve the conflict and they're not because it becomes more about the win than is it about a mutual understanding or resolution or a taking of responsibility. Now, Dr. E, as we're looking at, as you are adding to this graphic, right? Uh -huh. and, and we're looking at it, I can't help but notice that it almost looks like maybe what a, a heart sensor monitor, like an EKG might <laughs> look like, or even like something measuring brainwave activity. and. <laughs> And, and, and as things escalate, right? Like your heart rate would go up as things escalate or your brain activity might go up. I mean, I, I don't know if that was intentional on your part, but it, it certainly is interesting that it kind of has that look to it. Uh, well, there, is, are, there are definitely parallels because as we get in conflicts, what happens? Different chemicals are secreted in our body. We might have again, norepinephrine or excitatory neurotransmitters that can drive excitement. They, can, they often drive fear. And what's our reaction to fear? but the need to protect. Why? Because the purpose of fear lets us know when we might need to protect ourselves. Fear is all about survival. And that's now where we just touched on an idea of emotional specificity. That, that is that singular purpose of fear is it lets me know when we might need to protect ourselves. Again, we don't want to show that weakness in our culture because we've been taught, don't show weakness, never let them see a sweat. How many phrases do we have that sell that idea and contribute to that idea and try to drive it home? So, yeah, as we see this continuing to escalate, we see the, the, the side of, you know, that each side is zigzagging down and then up and down and up because we don't take time to process the emotion underneath. We react to what we're feeling almost at an unconscious, semi-conscious level. And then we immediately react to try to get our power back. So as this continues to escalate, we might get to that point to the where, where the parent says, go to your room. I'm sick and tired of this. Give me your phone. I don't want to hear from this. And don't come out until you're done. Now, at that idea, at that point, you think, well, the parent won because the kid goes away and they do their homework and then they're, you know, but what's what happened before that? So the, it looks like the child lost, the parent won. What is the parent still feeling inside? Failure, guilt, shame, often stupid, because again, stupid comes with multiple failures. So hopeless, helpless, they might feel lost from really connecting with their kid. And then afterwards, after these emotions and all these, this neurochemistry kind of calms down, then sometimes logic comes back into play. We're going to talk about that more again in the next episode as we talk about self-development. But and you I, can see these patterns play out. And I would imagine, Dr. E, even the child must feel some of those same emotions, right? Exactly. Um, as after they've gone to their room and sort of things have, people, the two parties have gone their separate ways, but still, right. you know, maybe exactly. there wasn't any de-escalation. No, well, and often because, well, it, it, the de-escalation is get out of my face. You know, <clears throat> that's often the de-escalation. And that's what we have to be aware of is really how are we communicating? Because is this really about helping your child advance in, this, in these moments? Or is this about you as the parent 
winning or you as the boss or you as the teacher, you as the politician, you know? So that's where often, remember, rescuers can become persecutors in these times. And that's that's where we affect trust because we're not accountable for ourselves in these times. We're blaming our kids for our reaction. when We're choosing to respond this way. And people don't realize that we have choices in what we choose to feel and how we choose to feel and how we choose to express it. Yep. And like you said, everything sort of comes down to that win or lose dichotomy, right? Uh, right. Just to review where we where we sort of started out here today, uh, exactly. win or lose and using all those things. Um, Dr. E, should we review some of the stuff here? I feel like we we learned a lot of new things here. Um, right. People should people should really think about conflict um, and that win or lose in these in these emotions that are you know um, mm -hmm. tied with either strength or weakness, right? Right. And I'll, let's put that up. Let's put that list up there once again, just so everyone can see some of the some of the key words: anger, arrogance, rage, defiance, flippancy, sarcasm, all on the strong side there. Uh, love also, also on the strong side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, love also on the strong side, but on the weak side as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, right. so people should really think about these, and as they go into their interactions with people, right? Be aware of this again. I think this is one of those things that a lot of people may just not be aware of. Uh, it's happening. It's yeah. underlying everything, but you're just, you know, unconscious of it, really. Right, right, and that's the thing. Like I said, as we get into self development, we we'll understand all the different emotions, attitudes, beliefs, perceptions, experiences that drive our behaviors that we're not even really taking stock. And those are the variables, the known and the unknown that that play into those calculations of what we do and when that often we're not even aware of those calculations happening. So again, in this, yeah, always remember that we're going to reduce emotions to wanting to which emotions are going to help us look strong. We can even play, often people will play the guilt card in the conflict. And that's where guilt and shame and embarrassment often becomes weapons of control. And when we use that as people, we use those emotions as weapons, then are people going to want to show those emotions? No. So that's where we get back to that flippancy. Flippancy, and especially this happens with kids as they get older and adults often use it, is I don't care. If I don't care, then I don't feel. If I don't feel, then I don't hurt. If I don't hurt, then you can't hurt me. If you can't hurt me, I can't lose. And if I can't lose, then I must win. So that is the, those are the steps to flippancy. And again, that's its purpose is a shield of non-caring when I feel threatened. So just because your kids look like they don't care, just know that they do, but they feel like they're losing and they got to win somehow. Interesting. So a lot of new things to think about here. A lot of words. Once again, that dichotomy win or lose that is the the ultimate of the four dichotomies that you talked about uh, right. that sort of governs every interaction every conflict at least right exactly exactly and that's the important piece to look at and understand is is win and lose and then strong and weak because too often we fall back on that and even people who want to look good or look right because remember we talked about that they're going to channel they're right through strong or they're good through strong. And that's where we get in that idea of righteousness in that and how it's expressed. But I think again, in this, if we, now here's the key to this is if we look at this, this uh, escalation of conflict and we see how that works. One of the keys that I teach people in this is that there is a, um, there is an inverse proportional relationship between the degree of strength shown in the surface and the degree of weakness perceived inside. So let me say that again, because this is huge. There's an inverse proportional relationship. So in other words, the stronger I look, often the weaker I'm feeling. The inverse proportional relationship between the degree of strength I'm showing on the surface and the degree of weakness I'm perceiving inside. So now we might look at well, then why do escalate? Why do conflicts escalate so quickly? Why does my kid start screaming at me when I just asked him if he did his homework? Because he's already been primed. He's not starting out the conflict in the middle of that low, that low high power um, range. He's starting out already primed. And that's where we're going to look at it, that so many of our, as I say, our pumps are primed. We're ready for that reaction. 
We're ready to feel blame. We walk around with that internalized sense of guilt, threat, fear, inadequacy, doubt. So why do we live in such a volatile culture now? Because so many people are ready to feel attacked because they're walking around with their lack of trust and feeling violated and used and misunderstood and unheard. And I think that's how we, again, we really want to understand that interplay between the conflict in our communities, the conflict in our political discourse, the conflict in our school with kids, the conflict with how we express ourselves through our even our protests, is it escalates so quickly because we don't have trust. And that's, to me, going to drive a lot of conflicts is mistrust. And we have mistrust, that's a fear-based emotion. So see the interplay between these and why things are blowing up so quickly. If we can have more meaningful discourses, if we can understand how do we get to that point of resolution, how do we get to that place of balance, then we're going to find a better outcome in the long run. And that's the issue is if we can take away this idea of win-lose and this hierarchical view of conflict, and we can let it become more equity-based, where we see, oh, my child's reacting to the idea of homework. And what if you just stop and ask, say, are you having a hard time in your classes? Or are you feeling overwhelmed with something? Or you say, you know, I remember when I was a kid in school, I had a really hard time with my homework, and I didn't want anything to do with it, and sometimes I avoided that. And what I learned over time is when I did do that, I felt more and more behind, more and more failure, more and more fear, more and more. So I help, I'm helping them to understand this conflict emotional, this, this complex emotional situation that's going on deep down inside and what it's important to do with that to help shift that. So, you know, really the important thing to understand here is that every emotion to me has a purpose. We've just never learned that in our culture. And getting that emotional education, which I hope people are really starting to get, as well as an understanding that emotional specificity is crucial to our outcomes in our own emotional algebra, understanding emo other people's emotion algebra, and then taking it to the cultural level, to the national level, to the, you know, to the geopolitical level to really understand we're all really alike. It's just we don't see it. We see more differences than how we're alike. Fascinating stuff, Dr. E. So I think we need to wrap up there, but um, quick, quick uh, tease for what's up on the next episode. Well, the next episode, we're going to talk about self-development, um, you know, to again, to, to, and to really, really quick wrap up on this, to look at this, these ideas, emotional specificity, failure tells me when it's time to learn. Guilt lets me know when I've done something to somebody else I need to fix. Shame lets me know when I've done something to myself I need to fix. Love lets me know when I feel an affiliation towards someone, something else, or, or myself. Rage protects me when I feel my integrity is threatened or I feel in fear of my life. Anger protects me when I feel threatened. You know, So I can go through each emotion and give you all a positive purpose, an equitable reason for why that emotion exists. And that's where I think we need to look at and start to shift our perspective and our view of emotions so that we can find uh, so we can find meaningful outcomes where we can not necessarily agree with each other, but we can have a more calm discourse to respect where each other's coming from. So again, next time, look forward to the self-development. You'll understand a lot about then what drives our conflict patterns and then what under what drives our relationships between each other. And uh, I hope to uh, that you'll take these examples and see how these uh, these conflict escalation patterns are working out. I would even challenge people to take this diagram here, this graph with the power and the, the point of communication, and even start with the conflict with the uh, body language communication and view that exchange and talk about that with the other person. What were you feeling before this? So how do you get into that? each emotion before the other. And yes, this is a, a lot to fill in in a short time and a short episode, but this, this conflict thing, we're going to come back to again and again and again in so many episodes. Yeah. I would say people can just screenshot. We put it up there so many times. People would just screenshot it and save it almost as a note card to, to refer back to and so right. forth. Exactly. All right, Dr. E. Very good stuff. Looking forward to the next episode. We'll Absolutely. see you all next time on Emotional Algebra with Dr. E. Until next time.